Einstein's work paved the way for the solution of yet another 19th century mystery in physics, the emission spectra of atoms. Ever since the 17th century, when Newton showed that sunlight is composed of various color components that can be recombined to produce white light, chemists and physicists have studied the characteristics of emission spectra, that is, either continuous or line spectra of radiation emitted by substances. The emission spectrum of a substance can be seen by energizing a sample of material either with thermal energy or with some other form of energy, such as a high-voltage electrical discharge. A red-hot or white-hot iron bar, freshly removed from a high-temperature source, produces a characteristic glow. This visible glow is the portion of its emission spectrum that is sensed by the eye. The warmth of the same iron bar represents another portion of its emission spectrum, the infrared region. A feature common to the emission spectra of the sun and of a heated solid is that both are continuous. That is, all wavelengths of visible light are represented in the spectra. The emission spectra of atoms in the gas phase, on the other hand, do not show a continuous spread of wavelengths from red to violet. Rather, the atoms produce bright lines in different parts of the visible spectrum. These line spectra are the light emission only at specific wavelengths. This figure is a schematic diagram of a discharge tube that is used to study emission spectra. And this figure shows the color emitted by hydrogen atoms in a discharge tube. The gas under study is in a discharge tube containing two electrodes. As electrons flow from the negative electrode to the positive electrode, they collide with the gas. This collision process eventually leads to the emission of light by the atoms or molecules. The emitted light is separated into its components by a prism. Each component color is focused at a definite position according to its wavelength and forms a colored image of the slit on the photographic plate. The colored images are called spectral lines. And this is the line emission spectrum of hydrogen atoms. Every element has a unique emission spectrum. The characteristic lines in atomic spectra can be used in chemical analysis to identify unknown atoms, much as fingerprints are used to identify people. When the lines of the emission spectrum of a known element exactly match the lines of the emission spectrum of an unknown sample, the identity of the sample is established. Although the utility of this procedure was recognized some time ago in chemical analysis, the origin of these lines was unknown until the early 20th century. This figure shows the emission spectrum of several elements. In 1913, not too long after Planck and Einstein's discoveries, a theoretical explanation of the emission spectrum of the hydrogen atom was presented by the Danish physicist Niels Bohr. Bohr's treatment is very complex and is no longer considered to be correct in all its details. Thus, we will concentrate only on his important assumptions and final results, which do account for the spectral lines. When Bohr first tackled the problem, physicists already knew that the atom contains electrons and protons. They thought of an atom as an entity in which electrons whirled around the nucleus in circular orbits at high velocities. This was an appealing model because it resembled the motions of the planets around the sun. In the hydrogen atom, it was believed that the electrostatic attraction between the positive solar proton and the negative planetary electron pulls the electron inward and that this force is balanced exactly by the outward acceleration due to the circular motion of the electron. According to the classical laws of physics, however, an electron moving in an orbit of a hydrogen atom would experience an acceleration toward the nucleus by radiating away energy in the form of electromagnetic waves. Thus, such an electron would quickly spiral into the nucleus and annihilate itself within the proton. To explain why this does not happen, Bohr postulated that the electron is allowed to occupy only certain orbits of specific energies. In other words, the energies of the electron are quantized. An electron in any of the allowed orbits will not spiral into the nucleus and therefore will not radiate energy. Bohr attributed the emission of radiation by an energized hydrogen atom to the electron dropping from a higher energy allowed orbit to a lower one and emitting a quantum of energy, or a photon, in the form of light. Bohr showed that the energies that an electron in a hydrogen atom can occupy are given by this equation, where Rh, the Rydberg constant for the hydrogen atom, has a value of 
2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. The number n is an integer called the principal quantum number. It has values of n can be equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. The negative sign in this equation is an arbitrary convention signifying that the energy of an electron in the atom is lower than the energy of a free electron, which is an electron that is infinitely far from the nucleus. The energy of a free electron is arbitrarily assigned a value of zero. Mathematically, this corresponds to setting n equal to infinity in the equation, so that the energy of an electron infinitely far from the nucleus would be equal to zero. As the electron gets closer to the nucleus, or as n decreases, en becomes larger in absolute value, but also more negative. The most negative value then is reached when n is equal to 1, which corresponds to the most stable energy state. We call this the ground state, or the ground level, which refers to the lowest energy state of a system. The stability of the electron diminishes as n increases to 2, 3, and so on. Each of these levels is called an excited state, or an excited level, which is higher in energy than the ground state. A hydrogen atom for which n is greater than 1 is said to be in an excited state. The radius of each circular orbit in Bohr's model depends on n squared. Thus, as n increases from 1 to 2 to 3 and so on, the orbit radius increases very rapidly. The higher the excited state, the further away the electron is from the nucleus, and the less tightly it is held by the nucleus. Bohr's theory enables us to explain the line spectrum of the hydrogen atom. Radiant energy absorbed by the atom causes the electron to move from a lower energy state, characterized by a smaller n value, to a higher energy state, characterized by a larger n value. Conversely, radiant energy, in the form of a photon, is emitted when an electron moves from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. The quantized movement of the electron from one energy state to another is analogous to the movement of a tennis ball either up or down a set of stairs, as is shown here. The ball can be on any one of several steps, but never between the steps. A journey from a low step to a high step is an energy requiring process, whereas movement from a higher step to a lower step is an energy releasing process. The quantity of energy involved in either type of change is determined by the distance between the beginning and ending steps. Similarly, the amount of energy needed to move an electron in the Bohr atom depends on the difference in energy levels between the initial and final states. To apply the equation written in red to the emission process of a hydrogen atom, let us suppose that the electron is initially in an excited state characterized by the principal quantum number n initial or Ni. During emission, the electron drops to a lower energy state characterized by the principal quantum number Nf, or N final. This lower energy state may be either a less excited state or the ground state. The difference between the energies of the initial and final states is defined as this. Delta E is equal to the final energy minus the initial energy. We can measure the final energy, like so, and we can measure the initial energy like this. And so if we put all of that together, we get that delta E is equal to the Rydberg constant multiplied by 1 over n initial squared subtract 1 over n final squared. Because this transition results in the emission of a photon of a certain frequency, we can also write that this is equal to h times nu. When a photon is emitted, n initial is going to be greater than n final. Consequently, the term that's in the parentheses here will be negative and delta E is going to be negative, or energy is going to be lost to the surroundings. When energy is absorbed, n initial will be less than n final and the term in parentheses, this term here, will be positive so that delta E will be positive. Each spectral line in the emission spectrum corresponds to a particular transition in a hydrogen atom. When we study a large number of hydrogen atoms, we observe all possible transitions and hence the corresponding spectral lines. The brightness of a spectral line depends on how many photons of the same wavelength are emitted. The emission spectrum of hydrogen includes a wide range of wavelengths from infrared to violet. The Balmer series was particularly easy to study because a number of its lines fall in the visible range. 
Each horizontal line in this figure represents an allowed energy level for the electron in a hydrogen atom. The energy levels are labeled with their principal quantum numbers. N is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on. Example 7.4, what is the wavelength of a photon in nanometers emitted during a transition from the n initial is equal to 5 to the n final is equal to 2 state in the hydrogen atom? So this is an emission spectrum. So let's start by calculating the amount of energy emitted by this photon. So we'll use the equation delta E is equal to the Rydberg constant multiplied by 1 over n initial squared subtract 1 over and final squared, and we can plug in some numbers. We have our Rydberg constant, 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Our N initial, is, so we have 1 over 5 squared, so that's 1 over 25. 1 over N final, so 1 over 2 squared, so that's 1 over 4. That's going to equal 2.18 times 10 to the 18 joules, multiplied by negative 0.21. And so that gives us a delta E, which is equal to negative 4.58 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. The reason we have a negative sign for our change in energy is because this is an emission. And so when we calculate the wavelength, we're just going to omit the negative sign. Now we know that delta E is going to be equal to hc over lambda and we can rearrange that formula to solve for lambda and so lambda is going to be equal to Planck's constant times c divided by our energy and so we'll plug in our numbers we have Planck's constant 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds multiplied by the speed of light, 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, and we're going to divide that by our energy. So again, 4.58 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. We'll double check our units, so joules cancel, as do seconds, and we're left over with meters. And so when we plug all that into our calculator, we get that our wavelength is equal to 4.34 times 10 to the negative seven meters.